and uh, very welcome to everybody this morning. Uh, welcome to our autumn webinar. Um, for those who don't know me, my name's Jo Evans and I'm head of the employment team here at Myerson Solicitors. Um, I'm also joined today by two colleagues who will be speaking to you as well as me, uh, Patrick Byrne, uh, one of the senior solicitors in our team, as well as Jo Henderson, another partner in the employment department. Um, great to welcome you all here today and to have so many attendees. Great also that we're able to run this session, which we would normally be running this time of year in the office. So albeit that it's virtual, um, great to, to be able to go ahead nonetheless. Um, it's obviously been a very challenging time um, for, for everybody over the recent months um, from a health perspective, but also from a business perspective. Um, and we've certainly noticed how difficult it has been for businesses to deal with their employment issues over recent months. Um, the constant change of the rules around furloughing and what employers should and shouldn't be doing in terms of employees being at work or not at work has been really difficult. Um, but we decided we're not going to talk about any of that today because what's been happening in the meantime is employment law has continued nevertheless. Um, so what we thought was important to do today was to talk to you about some of the really key areas um, that are still developing and have been over the recent months um, so that you've got an awareness of, of what's going on and what to expect in the coming months as well. So we've put together a top 10 for you today um, and let's... Um, uh, put up that agenda so you can see what to expect today. There we go. Um, so this is the agenda we're going to talk to today. Hopefully you can all see that. Hopefully you can also all see me and ideally Patrick and Joe as well. If you've got any technical issues, please do um, put a note in the chat tab at the bottom of the Zoom screen um, and people who are much cleverer than I will be able to help you with, with those. Um, so what are we going to cover? These are our top 10 issues, the most important things we want you to be aware of today. Um, I'm going to start with the first three. You might be familiar with this format that we, we've run before. Unfair dismissal, constructive dismissal and interim relief. Patrick's then going to talk to you about the next four items. So a TUPI update, a bit about settled status and immigration, and also um, the knotty issue of employment status that continues to be so difficult. And then Joe will continue and complete the morning with um, the final three sections. Um, and she'll talk about IR35, given that that is now going to be coming in in April, as well as an equal pay update and uh, wrapping up with uh, the really difficult area of, of employee data and what you can use and what you can't use. So that's the plan for the day. We've, we're aiming to talk for around 50 minutes. Um, if you've got questions, please add those to the Q&A um, tab at the bottom of Zoom um, and we'll pick those up at the end of the session. Um, and the other thing just to be aware of, we are recording this, we're recording us, not you, um, uh, but we will circulate the recording after the session this morning so that you've got a record and you can refer back to it. We'll also send you links to anything that's useful and relevant that we're talking about to you today. So hopefully that covers all the housekeeping and uh, we'll, we'll make a start. So first off, I want to talk to you about unfair dismissal. And I'm going to try and move the screen on to get to the unfair dismissal slide. Here we go. Great. I'm talking to you about unfair dismissal because this is still the most popular type of claim. Sorry, bear with me a second. Let me just go back slightly while I get used to the technology. Give me a moment while it returns to my slide. Um, still the most popular type of claim um, and it is um, an area that's inevitably going to increase given the difficulty that we have in uh, the economy at the moment. We anticipate that there's going to be um, people who are losing their jobs more frequently um, and we also anticipate that the, the value of claims is going to increase 
because people are going to find it harder to get alternative jobs. And the value of unfair dismissal claims is largely driven by how quickly people do find an alternative job. So I wanted to share two claims with you today because they give us some useful lessons and, and, and points to take away back to your businesses. The first is the case of K and L. This is an employment tribunal. Uh, appeal tribunal claim, sorry. Um, and just a little bit of uh, background um, uh, facts for you first. So this involved a teacher. He was accused of possessing a computer that had indecent uh, child images on it. Um, he was investigated by the police. There was a possibility of a prosecution, but it didn't proceed, although the police did say that they reserved the right to, to proceed in the future. That left the school needing to decide what to do and they disciplined him, which is, is not uh, unsurprising in the circumstances. Um, and the disciplinary focused on the fact that he'd been involved in a police investigation. The, the, that disciplinary concluded and ultimately the teacher was dismissed. And the reason for dismissal was stated that there had been a breakdown of trust and confidence. There wasn't a finding that the teacher was actually um, in possession of indecent images. It was just a breakdown of trust and confidence. There was then a second finding as well that there was a risk to the school of reputational damage if the teacher was prosecuted in the future. And that was, that was set out as another reason for terminating this teacher's employment. So he defended himself against those allegations. Um, he said he hadn't downloaded the images uh, onto his computer um, and the employer wasn't certain about that, hadn't made a specific finding about that. But nevertheless, you'd expect that to be a case where you think in those circumstances, a dismissal, a fair dismissal, end of story. But not here at all. In this case, um, it was held that the dismissal was unfair. Um, and the reasons for that were, were set, uh, a number and uh, just to take you through those, because this is where the learning points uh, are really interesting. Um, the first thing was that um, the teacher hadn't been told that um, one of the allegations he was facing was that he was going to cause reputational damage to the school. So he hadn't had a chance to defend himself against that allegation and therefore the dismissal was unfair because that was one of the reasons for dismissing him. So that's the first point. Um, the EAT also thought that the fact there could be a conviction in the future wasn't sufficient in, of itself. Um, so that was another reason why the dismissal was unfair. And then finally, the, the, the catch-all breach of trust and confidence term was, was found to be inappropriate. It wasn't made out that there had been a breach of trust and confidence here. Um, and therefore, overall, the dismissal was unfair. Why is this relevant? It's quite a niche set of facts, but it does apply to, to any situation. And the reason it's relevant is because of those learning points. Firstly, um, it's so important that if you are going to investigate a disciplinary matter, you do need to specify the allegations that are of concern. If allegations come up through the investigatory process, and, and that is often the case, then you must put those to the individual and give them the right of reply before making a final decision. So really important there. Um, then also getting your reason right for dismissal. We are getting lots of cases on this and we see lots of, of letters um, where people are, are asking for advice about dismissing. Uh, and this comes up again and again. There is a tendency to use the trust and confidence reason for dismissal, but actually, usually the, there is a specific reason to dismiss somebody. In this case, the teacher had indecent images on his computer. That, that was the nub of it, really, and therefore, why was that not the finding? Um, and that's why, ultimately, the, the, the case failed here. So the takeaway is get your reasons right, get the allegations put to the individual, and then set out your reasons really clearly and carefully in your dismissal missile letter. Great. Okay, also want to talk to you about a second case on unfair dismissal, which is the Gallagher and Scott Rail case. It's, this is another EAT case as well. Um, and this involved a senior manager who was dismissed. Bear with me, sorry, my slides aren't quite keeping up with me. 
there we go, sorry. Um, so a senior manager was dismissed. Um, and this is another very common situation that you've probably dealt with yourselves. We come across a lot. Um, senior manager, lots of workplace disagreements, difficult person to deal with, broken relationship with her line manager, business facing a critical time. She was dismissed for some other substantial reason, citing an irretrievable breakdown of relationships. Interestingly here, no process was followed, no right of appeal was given, she was simply dismissed and paid her notice. So a really unusual situation, and I'm sure you'd expect us to turn around and say you must never do that, and you're always going to face an unfair dismissal if you do that and don't follow a process. Now our advice will always be that you should follow a fair process, of course, um, to um, minimise the chances of an unfair dismissal, but this rare case as it was described um, has come along and in this case they said that a process would have made no difference that the relationship was broken in fact if they would followed a process it probably would have ended up worse and therefore uh, um, the dismissal was fair despite no process being followed at all now, we won't change our advice. We will still tell you to follow a fair process before dismissing anybody, but it's a useful case to have in your back pocket in case you are in a situation where you feel genuinely that that is going to be so difficult to go through a process. So it's just worth having that one in mind. Great. So moving on from unfair dismissal, um, I'm now going to look at constructive dissel, dismissal. Um, and a case that I want to share with you around constructive dismissal. This is the case of Williams and Alderman School. Um, just as a very quick refresh, if an employee says there's been a fundamental breach of contract by their employer and resigns in response, they're entitled to claim constructive dismissal. Um, that their resignation was caused by the employer and therefore was a dismissal. And that gives them the opportunity to claim the same compensation as in a, a normal dismissal, unfair dismissal claim. There always has to be a fundamental breach or a series of events with a final straw that together amount to a fundamental breach to, to bring a claim. Um, but I want to mention the Williams case because that's a recent case that's widened the scope for employees to bring constructive dismissal claims. Um, completely coincidentally, it's another teacher case, um, but the principles apply across any business in, in exactly the same way as my prior case. Um, teacher accused of a child protection issue in this case. Um, the school handled it really badly. They told him they were investigating, but didn't tell him what they were investigating. They left him hanging for a long time. He went off sick with stress for a long time. He wasn't able to defend himself. And eventually it was concluded it wasn't that big an issue and he just needed some retraining. So a, a bad handling of a process, probably a fundamental breach, but the employee didn't resign at that point. Later on, separately, um, for unrelated reasons, the employee was told that he couldn't be contacted by his union rep. So odd, but not that serious an issue. He resigns following that issue and claims constructive dismissal. And the issue is, well, hang on, there was a fundamental breach earlier, but a fairly innocuous issue later, how can he claim constructive dismissal? Well, the Employment Appeal Tribunal have said he can and he could and he was successful. Um, there doesn't have to just be a last straw in a series of issues. You can have a situation where there has been a fundamental breach in the past um, and then a fairly innocuous act later. And as long as the previous fundamental breach is in part the reason for resigning, um, the employee can claim constructive dismissal. So what does that mean? Well, obviously, as a starting point, try not to breach your contract of employment with your employees. Um, but if a situation arises, if something has gone wrong, then the lesson from the Alderman case is that you need to make sure you um, are alive to things that have gone wrong and bear in mind that those aren't necessarily going to become irrelevant if they're not acted on immediately. They could still be um, relied upon at a much later date if a minor issue happens later. So just bear that in mind. Moving on to section three, interim relief I want to talk to you about. Um, 
traditionally interim relief, very rare applications, you may not have heard of them at all, um, very limited circumstances when they can be made, but I'm mentioning them today because um, they are, uh, there's a resurgence in these claims coming through at the moment, and we're seeing a lot of them. I said I wouldn't talk about COVID today, but this is a COVID-related consequence, I think. Um, they're extremely onerous on employers when they are raised, so want you to be aware of them because they are much more popular now than they have been. Um, an interim relief application can only be brought if somebody has an automatic unfair dismissal case. And the, the situations that are relevant are if the individual has um, been dismissed for union membership or being involved with the union or for whistleblowing or for being a health and safety representative. Um, the individual in those cases can apply within seven days after dismissal for an emergency hearing and the tribunal tend to list those within a matter of days after the dismissal. You only are entitled to seven days notice. You have to turn up and you have to explain the reason why you've dismissed the individual. Um, so all hands to the pump, prepare for an emergency hearing. And the concern is, and the reason why you can't ignore these is if at that emergency hearing, the tribunal thinks it's likely that the individual was dismissed for her prohibited reason, then they can order the individual to be reinstated back to work or to be paid full pay and benefits until the full hearing of the case. So as an employer, you are faced with an individual on full pay sitting at home until a full hearing, which could be a year, maybe even two years hence puts the individual in a really strong position um, and so something that you just don't want to have to get involved in if you can possibly avoid it. So as I say, don't, don't haven't traditionally been raised very often. Um, usually in the past it was union members being uh, supported by unions who would bring these these applications but what we're seeing is covid related claims now as i mentioned before and to give you some examples of where this can crop up um, for example somebody who says they're concerned about going back into work um, because they think that the work environment isn't safe um, given the pandemic or somebody who says that um, there's a lack of PPE or a lack of safe processes in the way in which they work. Someone who might argue they've been pressurized to work when they're on furlough or they've been forced to take a reduction in pay um, or even somebody who claims that there's been a fraudulent claim under the job retention scheme to reclaim furlough pay. Any of those things are being raised and can be raised against employers. Um, also, if somebody says that they got their union involved and the company didn't like the fact that the union was involved in an issue that was raised, that would again give, give an angle. We're seeing those coming through as well. So if you do need to dismiss somebody, um, of, of course, you should follow your fair process. You should be very clear for the reasons for your dismissal as a general unfairness point anyway, but also making sure you're not falling into interim relief territory. Um, because, as I say, the consequences are, are really, really stringent. So flag that one to you as well. Um, and then that's the end of my section for now. I'm going to pass you over to Patrick. Um, he's now going to talk to you about Chupi and the other issues on, on the agenda that are under his name. Great. Thanks, Joe. Hello everyone. I'm going to start by talking to you about some recent 2P cases that should be interesting. I'm going to, then going to move on to a couple of other topics. As I go through, feel free to type in questions at the bottom and we'll do our best to do a bit of a QA at the end. So the first case I'm going to talk to you about is concerns ISS facility services. And this was actually a case from Belgium and it concerned the acquired rights directive and the Belgian national laws that actually implement that. Now in the UK, obviously, we implement that with the 2P regulations. And the effects of all those laws are that if an, there's an employee in a transferring um, business, its employment contract will transfer across to the transferee business along with the transfer, transfer or employer's obligations and rights. That's fairly well understood. What was interesting about this case is that there were potentially multiple transferees involved. And there was a bit of confusion as to what should actually happen in that situation. 
Now, ISS were a cleaning company and they covered three distinct lots of buildings. The claimant was a project manager for all three of those areas, but ISS actually lost the contract and two of the lots went to a company called Italian and one of them went to a company called Cleaning Masters. Most of the claimant's role was with Italian, but she did do some work in the buildings that Cleaning Masters inherited. And this led to a bit of a dispute because ISS were trying to say that actually all of her employment has transferred over to Italian. And Italian were, were saying, well, actually, there's been no transfer at all here. So there's no binding contract with us. And out of this confusion, the claimant brought claims for unpaid payments against both ISS and Italian. And in the first instance, the Belgian court sided with Italian. They said that the claimant here does administrative work. She's not really you know, involved in the cleaning side of things. So she hasn't transferred at all. ISS appealed, obviously trying to prevent themselves being liable. And they argued that, well, this claimant's contract should have been proportionately allocated to both Italian and cleaning masters, with Italian taking about 85% of the contract and cleaning masters taking about 15% of the contract. On appeal, the court agreed that, well, actually, yes, there has been a transfer here, but the court was a bit confused about what this should mean for the employment contract. So they went to the ECJ for a bit of guidance. And the ECJ's opinion was, well, actually, they agreed with um, ISS and said it's fine for the contract to be divided between Italian and cleaning masters, with both of them taking something of a part-time contract with her. Now, the, the reason that's interesting is that what typically happens in the UK at the moment, or the trend is, the way you've got multiple transferees, the employment will transfer to whichever transferee is taking on most of the services. So we, we haven't really had a case like this at the moment. And it could be interesting because it gives transferees, I suppose, a bit of a lifeline if they're taking perhaps most of the services, but they're not taking all of them, there may be a route for them to reduce their own liability. So we may see that cropping up as an argument um, that they use in negotiations or perhaps if a claim is brought. It is important to remember in these situations where you've got complicated 2P transfers with multiple parties, that these services have to retain their identity um, for there to actually be a 2P transfer. So it is possible in a if the facts have been slightly different here, you know, were there four, five, six different cleaning companies or had the services been so fragmented, they lost their identity that there could have been no transfer at all. The next case I'm gonna to talk to you about is Ferguson versus Astria Asset Management. And it's a case that involved four directors of a property management company. Now they entered into a property management agreement with various property owners. And they were, it's also important to state they were employers, uh, employees of the company as well. And their clients served notice on them under the property management contract to end that agreement because the property owners wanted to bring in a third party to manage the properties instead. It was accepted that there was going to be a 2B transfer, so that wasn't in dispute at all. But shortly before the transfer, the four directors and employees gathered together to enhance their contracts with lots of lucrative payments and benefits for themselves, including termination payments. So it's, it's almost as though they saw the writing on the wall that perhaps Astria were going to dismiss them after the transfer. Now, Astria dismissed two of them shortly after the transfer, and they argued that two more weren't actually employees, so they didn't transfer under 2P. This led to the claimants bringing various claims, predictably, including claims for their new contractual terms. And the employment tribunal in this case turned to regulation 4.4 of the 2P regulations. And this says that where there's a variation of a contract, it will be void if the sole or principal reason for that variation was the 2P transfer. Now, this normally comes up where you've got a transferee that has perhaps gone a bit rogue or is trying to make adverse changes to the staff it's inheriting, perhaps to bring them in line with its existing contracts with staff. But the question here was whether it could apply to this situation where they've given themselves lots of beneficial changes. And the ET held, well, actually, yes, there's no contradiction there. The regulation doesn't specify that it only applies to adverse changes. So it applied it to this situation and it said that actually, uh, it, it was a rather duplicitous act by these individuals. And the only reason they made it were for um, 
self-serving reasons. There was no commercial reason for the business here. So therefore the changes were void. And, and it's, I think it's an interesting case because you could potentially see it coming up where perhaps you've got a small business with senior employees holding a lot of control. They may try and run through contractual changes like this. Um, it, there are limits to it. So I don't think it will take away benefits from deserving employees because it's important to remember it will only apply um, where the reason for the change is the 2P transfer itself. If there's an objective business reason for those changes that qualifies as an economic, technical or organisational reason uh, entailing changes in the workforce, then whatever that change was has a good chance of, of being binding. So I'm now going to come on to a little bit about the dreaded topic of Brexit. Um, it's actually sunk out of the news. Oops, sorry about that. It's actually sunk out of the news recently, obviously, with everything that's been going on with COVID. But we're actually rapidly approaching the end of the year. And on the 31st of December, we're going to see the end of the transition period. And that will end freedom of movement rights for both UK citizens and EU citizens coming to the UK. Now, this will probably this is an area that will probably interest any organisations that have EU staff on the books, or perhaps people who have plans in the future to rely upon uh, workers from the EU. Now, one of the best ways for EU citizens to retain the right to live and work here into 2021 and beyond is to use the settlement scheme. There's no obligation on them to do that. And there's no there's no uh, obligations written into law for you, the employer, to then help them with the application. But it makes sense if you do want to make sure you're not going to have gaps in your workforce next year. So I've put together this timeline, which should be helpful for you. Um, it contains the key cutoff dates and deadlines you should be aware of. So to access the EU settlement scheme, they need to be in the UK living here by the 31st of December. If they're not, they can't access the EU settlement scheme. And from the 1st of January, their freedom of movement rights will end. And if they want to live and work here past that date, they'll have to apply under the far stricter points-based system that's being introduced. Another date not to lose sight of is the 30th of June next year. Now it's all well and good if they've arrived on time, but they then need to get their application in through the government website by the end of June. And I've put a few details on this slide about what that application looks like under the settlement scheme. Importantly, they'll need to give details of their UK residence and how long they've been residing in the UK for will determine whether they get settled status or pre-settled status. They need to have been living in the UK for five continuous years to get settled status. But if they don't quite have that, they can get pre-settled status. And in the future, once they've been here for the requisite five years, they can then reapply for that permanent residency status. So I'll now cover the situation of, well, what happens if you're, you know, dealing with EU citizens from the 1st of January onwards? Well, the settlement scheme will then be closed to them, but you'll have to think about whether you wish to become a sponsored employer under the new points-based system. And this system is designed to equalize how we're treating EU immigrants and non-EU immigrants. It's open to three broad categories, which I've highlighted here. Now, 99% of employers are going to be using the skilled workers route because the other two are quite specialist. You need a sponsorship license that will last for four years. And if you're an existing sponsored employer, you should be able to use an existing license to apply to EU workers as well. I've put some details on this page about some of the criteria. Obviously it's very detailed and specialist, so this isn't um, comprehensive, but you'll need to meet certain qualifying criteria as a business, which I've highlighted here. And if you're going down the skilled worker route, which most will, you'll need to meet a certain points threshold. So that's 70 points. And you can make up those 70 points with a mixture of mandatory criteria and also various optional criteria. But broadly speaking, this vacancy will need to have a certain skill level. The candidate will need to have a certain ability in the English language um, and there'll need to be a certain level of salary threshold if you want to bring them in to work for you. <laughs> 
So I'm now going to come on to talk to you about some employment status cases. Um, and just before, in fact, just before I finish on immigration, I suppose some of the takeaways there are to, if you're thinking of action points, perhaps spread awareness to EU staff now. Um, think about your right to work checks as well and make sure you're getting the correct immigration permission from people because obviously that passport is only going to be effective for so long and if you're issuing offer letters and contracts you should perhaps think about do you have you put caveats in there you know have you put right to work warranties in the contract itself um we've got a brexit team at myerson's and we do produce some materials ourselves so what i'll do uh, for those that are interested i'll send out some guidance sheets on those topics for you after the seminar So I'll now come on to talk to you about employment status. And again, it's it's disappeared off the radar a bit because of everything that's been going on, but it's a live area of employment law. And it'll be of particular interest to anyone that uses contractors because it can be such a tricky area. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about two cases. The first is City Sprint. And this was a group claim for backdated holiday pay that was brought by a set of their couriers. And the timeline is quite interesting in uh, this claim. Obviously, to get their backdated holiday pay, they had to establish that they were in fact workers and not independent contractors. Now, what happened in 2017 for City Sprint was in the January of 2017, they actually conceded a worker status case to an individual courier. They then obviously panicked about that and made sweeping changes to their contracts in November 2017. Fast forward to today, and they were hit with this group claim. And now initially the claimant said, well, because you've conceded that case previously, nothing's really changed in practice here. So we should be granted worker status as well, following the logic that was applied in that case. And the judge actually firmly denied that at the outset here and reminded them that these cases are gonna be looked at on their own merits and that what contract is in place is a very important factor in that. So the judge went in to look at the new terms that City Sprint had put in place and decided that, well, although there's flexibility there, there was a contractual right of substitution in there. And if you're not aware, a right of substitution allows a contractor to decide who's going to do the work, really. They can do it themselves or they can substitute someone in to do it for them or do it alongside them. Now, the judge said, well, although there's that flexibility in there, that's only theoretical. I can't see that being carried out in practice. And the judge followed the reasoning that was applied in other cases and asked himself, well, what's the dominant feature of this contract? And when he drilled into what was going on day to day, he said the dominant feature is personal performance by the individual courier. So although the couriers had flexibility over their working patterns, once they were on the clock and they indicated to City Sprint, I'm ready to work, they were really expected to, to accept the instructions perform them personally themselves until the end of the working day. And there wasn't really any flexibility around that. Also, when the, when the judge took a step back and looked at the relationship as a whole, City Sprint couldn't be said to be a client of these couriers or a customer, because although the couriers did have other jobs that they did, they weren't couriers for third parties and they weren't even marketing themselves couriers to third parties. So weighing all that together, they said, well, actually, these people are workers. They're not independent contractors. I'm going to contrast that with another case involving Yodel, which went well, which looks like it's going the other way. Now, the employment tribunal in this case hasn't given a judgment yet, but it did look to the ECJ to give it some guidance on this situation and the criteria it should use to decide whether they were workers um, or independent contractors. I've put some facts in there that show um, some of the situations here that they could appoint a substitute. Um, and that they could use their own vehicles and equipment. And the ECJ started by saying, well, the feature of an employment relationship is that there are duties that are performed for another party and that you're then remunerated for them. And the ECJ also said that when we're thinking about um, independent contractors, the key is looking for flexibility in how the work's being done. And also the existence of any kind of hierarchical relationship that's more akin to an employer and a worker. So the ECJ then applied that to this situation for the Yodel workers and said, well, there's a right to appoint a substitute. They can accept work and decline work. 
they've got the ability to provide them their services and they do market themselves to other parties and they can also change their hours and they even had control over day-to-day -day details like when they delivered something or what route they were going to take on the delivery they had that element of independence and so the ecj has suggested that those delivery dr um, drivers are work uh, on sorry are not workers and are independent contractors so it's just worth making that comparison to the city sprint case where although they had a great contract actually what was going on in practice is that these individuals didn't control when they were working they didn't control how they were working um, and they didn't control where they were working so so that's what decided those two cases i think um each case will have a whole host of factors from the facts that are considered but the lesson to take away is if you do have contractors in place you should be thinking at the outset what are our, what do our contracts say are they watertight and also do we need to get advice on what's going on in practice because you might find that a judge just sweeps aside whatever your contract says and goes with what's happening on the ground so that brings me to the end of my topics and i'm now going to hand you over to joanne henderson Good morning, everybody. Um, we're on the final straight. I'm going to cover the final three topics uh, that we have on our agenda. Uh, and the first of those is IR35. And, and the first point to make, I suppose, is that in our autumn uh, update last year, I talked about IR35 because it was anticipated that the new rules would come into effect in April 2020. In fact, what happened was that the government postponed um, the, the rules coming into force because it was recognised at that time that that did place uh, an administrative burden on employers at a time when businesses were trying to, to deal with the effects of the pandemic. There was also a, a lack of clarity around the details behind the IR35 rules. Uh, and what we've seen over the last year is um, some clarification um, and also now confirmation that the rules will come into effect uh, in April 2021. And so it's time to, to dust off the preparations that you did in anticipation of April 2020 uh, and get the house in order ready to deal with IR35 if it applies to you because you're not a small employer. Um, just to recap really, and just a visual slide to remind everybody what IR35 means. Um, this is relevant where an individual is providing their labor through a personal services company or an intermediary. Um, and the definition there is quite wide and that's been one of the clarifications over the year. Where it can be said that the relationship between the individual and the client or the end user looks like an employment relationship, but it's provided through a personal services company. What currently happens is that the personal services company must recognize that and then operate the PAYE regime to deduct tax and national insurance contributions. The change that the new rules bring in is that from April 2021, the responsibility and the burden for determining what the status of that relationship is between the individual and the end user shifts up to the client. Or, um, that's where the determination happens and the operation of the PAYE shifts to whoever it is or whatever uh, company in the supply chain is actually making the payment to the personal services company. So that puts quite a, a burden on the end user and this applies to companies where that are of medium or large. So where turnover is over 10 million pounds or the balance sheets over 5 million pounds. Um, so what does that mean? Um, it, it means that we, first of all, there's an exercise in identifying which contractors and providers of labour are caught by the regime. And it's worth looking at that again, not only because there might be different people involved in that group, but also because there may have been a change of circumstances over the course of the year. That might mean that some people now fall within regime uh, that previously didn't. So it's worth going through that reassessment in advance of April next year. 
If it seems like an administrative burden that you don't want to carry, making a, a status determination each time you contract uh, to have labour provided, then some of the options are to perhaps require the arrangement to be provided through an employment agency or employment business or maybe an umbrella company. In those cases, it's the agency or the umbrella company uh, that must operate the uh, PAYE uh, regime. The status determination still falls on the end user, but at least then you don't have to operate PAYE. And importantly, there's no need to account for the additional national insurance contributions and apprenticeship levy that goes with that. So that's one option to get around it. And again, there's been clarification there because there was some uncertainty uh, about umbrella companies in particular. Um, but that is a that is a recognised way around having to operate PAYE yourself in relation to these types of atypical workers. Other steps to, to take um, now are to, if you are going to accept that you have people in your labour force that are going to provide uh, labour in this way, is to make sure that you have in place proper procedures to make sure that you can make that status determination and that you can demonstrate that it's been made and made in a consistent way. HMRC is, is entitled to see uh, in, uh, detailed documentation as to how you've reached that uh, conclusion. And one option there perhaps is to use the government's assessed tool um, online. Um, and that's a useful tool to use if it gives you the right answer, um, because then HMRC will be bound by that decision, which is a, another point that's been um, confirmed, provided that the information that you've put into the system, of course, is accurate in the first place. The other procedure that you need to have in place is how you are going to deal with cases where the individuals are not happy with the outcome of the status determination uh, that you have made. Obviously, there's a cost implication um, for everybody where people are drawn into the IR35 regime. Uh, not least because of the additional national insurance contributions. And so it's, it's unpopular as for many people, they don't want to be uh, falling within the rules. And so we expect to see challenges and having a system in place for dealing with that challenge is important uh, because unless and until you've dealt with the challenge, then you as the end user are responsible for uh, operating PAYE. So that, that's another um, another piece of documentation to get in place of course is your contracts with the parties that you are transacting with. Uh, if you are entering into a, a contract uh, with a personal services company then you need to reserve the right in that contract for you to operate PAYE if IR35 applies and even if it doesn't apply at the time you enter into the contract it's it's good forward thinking to include that clause in your contracts in case the circumstances change over time. Equally, if you're entering into contracts with employment businesses or employment agencies, it's important to get clear in the contract who is going to be responsible for operating PAYE. And finally on this, um, a practical point is to make sure that you've got appropriate pay role systems in place in advance of April to make sure that you can deal with people who provide labour in this way through your payroll system. And that might be quite complex because there might be uh, VAT considerations also to take into account when you're entering into financial transactions um, with these workers. And you might also want to make sure that these workers are identifiable as a group of people caught by IR35 and not straight employees because that's going to affect reporting including for example uh, gender pay gap reporting. Uh, that's all I've got to say about IR35. It's a reminder really on where we were last year um, that we need to uh, make sure that all our arrangements are in place in advance of April because it is now uh, going to come into force then. So the next topic for me to look at uh, is equal pay. Um, and it's interesting to look at this at this point in time because 2020 marks the 50th anniversary of the Equal Pay Act in 1970. So that's half a century of us trying to deal with the inequality in pay between men and women. And we have, of course, made progress, but we have not completely closed the gender pay gap. And so this remains very much a a hot topic and an issue that employers need to address. 
Uh, in recent years, we have seen steps to further uh, address the gap. We saw the introduction of gender pay gap reporting, uh, and that stumbled a little bit because, again, uh, because of the administrative burden that that places on employers who are caught by the regime, so that's employers with 250 or more employees, uh, the government decided to postpone uh, the reporting for the snapshot data that would have been reported from April 19. So the way that the reporting works is information is taken as at April 19 to be reported by April 2020. The government said that there would be no enforcement of the reporting in April 2020, which has meant that only about 50% of employers caught have actually done the reporting. Uh, there is no suggestion, however, that the snapshot of information um, from April 2020, which should be reported in April 2021, uh, should not happen. So it appears that employers have now got to take steps to make sure that they do the reporting in time for April next year. And that's going to be a difficult task that uh, employers might need to start thinking about at this stage, because the state of our payrolls in April 2020 was very much affected by people who were perhaps off sick, people who were on furlough pay or who had other, other otherwise agreed to low pay. Um, and so there's going to be quite a lot of uh, different statistical information that employers are going to have to report and perhaps therefore further explanatory information that they need to include in their reports. So it might be a bigger task than it has historically been and it was quite a, a difficult task in the first place. So looking ahead and thinking about gender pay gap reporting in April 2021 is something to put um, on the to-do list. Um, to, to mark the 50th anniversary of the Equal Pay Act, ACAS has issued uh, some new guidance this year to assist both employers and employees uh, in understanding better equal pay and addressing uh, the gender pay gap. Um, it's a, it's a very good introduction, actually, into issues of equal pay. And in particular, there is a section in there for employers, which talks about how to avoid or prevent issues of equal pay arising in the first place. And that might include uh, introducing an equal pay policy, which might be an appropriate thing to do at this point in time. It is a useful guide. It doesn't displace and, and shouldn't be regarded as displacing the Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission Code of Practice on Equal Pay, which is the definitive guide uh, on ensuring that you understand properly issues of equal pay and, and how to address those. So very much still um, a hot topic. And just to demonstrate that, um, we are still seeing cases come through the tribunals interpreting the equal pay uh, legislation 50 years on. And I just wanted to illustrate that with a case that we've seen re uh, come through the Court of Appeal, so a very senior court this year, uh, clarifying the law in this area. What the Equal Pay Act does is it introduces into each contract of employment an equality clause. So it implies that all men and women should be paid the same amount. But there are a number of defences that can be applied. And one of those is the material factor defence, meaning that an employer can explain the difference in pay with a non-discriminatory reason. And the question in this case was, was the material factor something that must be justified? So must it be uh, reasonable and justifiable or must it just be a fact? So the facts of the case were that uh, Mrs. Walker, uh, who was uh, employed by the co-op, was promoted in 2014 to Chief Human Resources Officer on the Executive Committee, but she was not paid at the same rate as others on the Executive Committee. In 2015, in a job evaluation study, her work was rated as of equal value to those on the executive committee. Uh, this resulted in a dispute and her demanding equal pay and ultimately leaving the organisation and raising an equal pay claim. And the, the co-op's material factor defence used in the, in the litigation was that well, with a number of material factors they raised. They said that other roles in the organization were vital and hers wasn't, which was a bit rude. Um, that she had only been recently promoted into the executive uh, committee, whereas others have been there longer. 
she was of a limited flight risk and also in relation to one case a corporate lawyer he was paid at a market rate so all of those are on the face of it material factors that might influence pay the employment tribunal found that um, these factors might have been applicable in 2014 but by 2015 at the time of the job evaluation study those factors were no longer relevant and that mrs walker should therefore succeed in her claim and the case went through the eat and ultimately up to the court of appeal and the court of appeal disagreed saying that a material factor only needed to explain on a factual basis what caused the differential in pay in the first place and provided it wasn't a discriminatory reason it need not be justified or reasonable it just had to explain the difference in pay and I think what this case demonstrates is that we are still grappling 50 years on with the complexity of this legislation and there is a real risk still of employment of uh, employment tribunal claims in relation to equal pay and so taking the opportunity now to uh, look at equal pay policies and make sure that in conjunction with gender pay gap reporting, uh, employers get straight on this issue and make sure that they are achieving equal pay um, for their uh, employees. So finally then, we're on the final topic um, and now I'd like to move on and talk about data protection um, and some interesting developments. GDPR and data protection, of course, uh, remains very relevant uh, and very much a hot topic, again, that we're all learning to interpret as we go along. Uh, and this is an interesting case. It's actually a German case, but interesting to me for a number of reasons, not least because my teenage daughter shops at H&M and so I'm unimpressed that they are having to pay out huge fines and perhaps increasing their prices. Uh, but H&M in Germany were fined a whopping 35 million euros for collecting excessive employee data. Uh, their practices included return to work interviews and um, they called them welcome back interviews which they conducted following both holidays and absences so a very common and appropriate practice in an employment context. The data that they were collecting included uh, symptoms, diagnoses, holiday experiences and beyond their return to work process, they also collected data from what they called corridor chats, where they would pick up information about employees and record that in a central system as well. And that information included details about family issues and also religious beliefs. So they had collated a huge amount of information about their employees. And what they were doing was effectively profiling their employees and making employment decisions based on this central bank of information that they held. And this information was available to 50 managers within the organization. Inevitably, you might think um, there was a security breach in October 2019, and that allowed access to the employee data company-wide so everybody could see the information and as a consequence of that of course uh, the regulator in Germany became involved and that resulted in a very significant fine. So there's, there's a lesson to us all there about the level of information being collated. So the question is, is it still a good idea um, to conduct return to work interviews? And yes, it is for lots of reasons, uh, not least absence management. Uh, it's a good practice, but it must be uh, conscious of the data protection implications uh, as you're going along. So the guidance uh, is that if, if you're going to have managers conducting return to work interviews, it's important that they understand their obligations in relation to data protection and that they are trained in relation to that. Return to work interviews should be in private and only those who need to be there should be there. They should follow a consistent format. So having a form and restricting the information that is collected is going to be a useful practice to demonstrate how you've gone about collecting the data. And the only data that should be collected and reported is that which might affect the individual's work or their performance, might affect health and safety issues or their future attendance. Uh, that information should, of course, be secured very securely and the access to it must be limited to those who need to know it. And the information should only be used, of course, for legitimate reasons. And that will be absence management, health and safety and managing disabilities. 
So yes, it's very much a practice that should continue, but uh, with that caveat of making sure that you are not collecting too much data or irrelevant data and making sure that you're working within the data protection principles. So the final slide then, and the last thing I want to say about data protection, and it's just to signpost to you really new data um, protection guidance in relation to subject access requests. And in the context of the employment relationship, this is uh, where the most common issue we see where an aggrieved employee or former employee perhaps submits a request to understand what information is held about them or perhaps just to be a nuisance in the context of a dispute. Um, and the new guidance provides some helpful clarification for those responding to these types of requests. So the first, for the first time, we see this concept of stopping the clock to obtain clarification from the individual making the request. And this is potentially useful. It can only be used where there is a genuine need for clarification about what the request is and where as the holder of the information there is a large amount of information that you might need to consider in response to that request. Uh, the ICO provides um, an example here which is useful to understand the concept where a receptionist works in a doctor's surgery so she's an employee She's also a patient and she is also a carer to her mother. And so there's lots of information about her in that context, too. She makes a data subject access request and it's quite legitimate for the surgery to stop the clock and ask for clarification about what information she actually needs. In what context does she need that information? Is it as a patient? or as an employee or otherwise, and are there particular dates that she's interested in given the potential um, period of time over which that data might have been collected. Um, once that clarification is um, provided, then the clock starts again. So there is one month is the time period within which to respond to a data subject access request, but in those circumstances, the clock can be stopped to give you a little bit more time. And so it's potentially very useful a tool for us to be able to use. The guide also uh, provides some more clarification around the meaning of certain terms uh, used in data subject access requests. There is an opportunity for uh, organisations and employers to um, charge a fee sometimes or ultimately to refuse to respond to a request that is manifestly excessive. And the definition here has a uh, that the ICO has provided some further explanation about that, what that means, and also effectively broadened the idea of when a request is manifested, manifestly excessive. Unfortunately, there is no example here, and it's very much driven by uh, the context of the request um, and the kind of information you might hold, how much information you might hold. So what might be manifestly excessive to one organization might not be manifestly um, excessive to another organization. And so the trick is to look at the context and to uh, employ a proportionate type uh, response to this. But it's clear that there is more scope perhaps for responding to a request by saying that it is manifestly excessive. Linked to that is the possibility of charging a fee where requests are excessive or where they are unfounded. Uh, they might be manifestly unfounded, for example, because they are malicious and there's no real intent in understanding what information is held, but rather uh, that uh, it's just a difficult thing for the employer to respond to. Uh, the further clarification provided by the ICO is what a reasonable fee or might be to charge and there's not been a clear answer to that before. It's now clear that in addition to administrative costs like photocopying, postage, the cost of the USB stick that you might send out in response, you can also charge for the time that is spent by a member of staff in responding to the request. Uh, the charge will be based on an hourly rate uh, depending on how much uh, the value is of the employee spending the time trying to respond to the request. So again, that's a useful piece of information in circumstances where, a charge, where charging a fee is appropriate. But again, that's only where the request is manifestly excessive or unfounded. I've rushed a little bit that last, uh, last few sentences to get to a close because that's the end of my um, 
a talk on those final topics and it's taken us to 11 o'clock. Um, I'm going to hand you back to Joe Evans uh, in relation to uh, questions set. And thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks very much. Um, hopefully you've all found those topics useful this morning. Um, as Joe says, we have got to 11, although we do have um, a couple of questions. So for those that are happy to stay on, we can deal with those. Um, and for those that do need to go, we understand, and but we will send the video and, and so you can see the answers uh, subsequently. Um, the first one, um, I'll, I'll, while we're talking about data protection, and it's fresh in our minds, Joe, this is one for you. We've had a question that says, what is the position on data protection at the end of the Brexit transition period? Can you sum up a quick response to that, Joe? I will. Uh, a quick response is um, we are still hopeful that there will be an adequacy, adequacy decision from Europe. That means that the UK regime will be adequate. There was an announcement only last month to say that the discussions are ongoing. We hope that will happen. And assuming that does happen, we can, can continue the free flow of employee data, both in and out of the UK uh, and, and Europe at the end of that period. Failing that, being pessimistic, it's still going to be okay to send employee data to Europe. The issue will be getting information out of Europe and into the UK, in which case special uh, contractual provisions will need to be adopted. Um, and, that, and that's an, an area to watch. Fabulous, that was succinct, thank you. <laughs> um, the next one, one for you, Patrick. Um, going back to your 2P talk, and you mentioned the ISS case, um, and the question is, do, does this case, the ISS case, mean you can't use fragmentation anymore as an argument to not receive an employee under 2P? Uh, no, it doesn't, is the short answer. Um, and I, it didn't come up in that case, I think, because there was quite, um, quite a clean transfer where you had just two transferees taking on two lots of cleaning services. Um, you could still use fragmentation to say that there was never a 2P transfer in the first place. So this would be where the, there are multiple transferees. And because of that fact, the, the services that are transferring have changed so much, they fragmented down that they're, not, that they're fundamentally different and therefore 2P doesn't apply. So you could still use that if you're a transferee to argue you take no liability. But um, even so, the ISS case is useful for you because if you're wrong on that, you may then wish to use the ISS case as a basis to take less of the liability rather than taking all of it. That's great, Patrick. Thank you. Um, another one for you while you're um, on is um, going back to settled status that you talked about a bit earlier. Um, the question is, um, I understand we don't have to do a retrospective check if a valid check took place originally. This is in relation to settled status. But if an employee does not have a settled status, what do we do? Well, you, sh you should make sure you're doing checks because if, if someone's going to work for you, you need to make sure that legally they have the right to work here. So there are things you can do with your existing staff, uh, like just reaching out to them to make sure they're aware of the settlement scheme, see if they've applied or not. You may have already done that. Um, for new staff, I, I would make sure you're seeing the right document at the outset. So if they do have permission under the settlement scheme, they'll have a paper form permission and they'll have a digital form. The one you actually need to see is the digital form. But um, so have a look on the government guidance because they tell you what you should be looking out for. Um, but worst case scenario, if you find out that someone actually doesn't have permission to work here, then it's worth having a review of your contracts to make sure you've got caveats in there against that. And it's also worth considering that ultimately um, illegality can be uh, stat in, under statute. It can be a fair reason to dismiss someone. You know, if they just don't have the right to be working here, you would be breaking the law by having them work here. So uh, ultimately that could be a fair route to dismiss them. Great, thanks, Patrick. Um, and the last question, which, which I'll pick up, um, we think we may have to ask employees to accept a reduction in pay when the furlough scheme starts to unwind. Are we at risk of interim relief applications if employees do not agree to the reduction in pay? 
Um, this is something obviously lots of employers have had to do already or uh, are planning for the future, um, th this idea of asking employees to take reductions in pay. Um, ultimately, if employees do not agree to a reduction, then there is um, the possibility of, of dismissal as a last resort. Obviously, a full process should be followed first, consultation, consideration of particular um, situation before making that final decision. Um, the interim relief point is, is important. It does have to be taken into account at, at that stage if you do end up in a situation where you do feel you have to dismiss somebody for not accepting a pay reduction. Um, however, it would only be relevant if you dismiss somebody for complaining about being forced to accept a reduction in pay. That's where interim relief comes in. The, the problem is, in practice, things can get quite grey and muddled, so it's treading a clear path down the route of your process towards dismissal, um, demonstrating why it's absolutely critical to your business to have to make a reduction in pay, and the fact that that is your reason for dismissal, as opposed to any complaint or any union involvement that an employee might, um, might, might start bringing into play. So hopefully that answers that question as well. So that's the end of the questions. Thank you for submitting those. As I say, hopefully you found the session uh, useful today. Clearly lots of developments. They are going to continue. Whatever happens with this pandemic, we will continue to, to experience developing employment law as well. Um, so do get in touch if you need any help. Um, we also have now our Myerson HR retainer service, um, which is a fixed fee service, helpline service. Um, and we've been finding that clients in these difficult times are finding that very useful in order to fix their fees. So if you did want to talk to us about that, then obviously please do get in touch and we're happy to talk through that with you. Um, as I said at the outset, we have videoed this session, so we will send that round to you afterwards. Um, we'll also send you a video that we've already done of uh, how to deal with redundancies, because clearly we know that that is going to be something that is likely at the forefront of many organisations' minds. So we will send you that as well. Um, and please do get in touch if you need any help. Um, so again, thank you ever so much for joining us. Hope you found it helpful and very much looking forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.